These guys never once encountered Christ in the way that they needed to encounter Christ. And we're going to begin to see it over and over again. And uh, it was really jealousy that was driving them. And so I want to just point out four things this morning. As we go through this, I'm just going to explain the scripture. We're a little bit short on time. And I'm going to get four points in here in about the next seven minutes. Think I can do it? I can. Okay, number one. We, what we see at this passage is what it means to be a friend. What it means to be a friend. This is a, such an important aspect of this particular passage. Jesus is teaching all these people are gathered around and people are hearing this and they begin to know that if they can get somebody to Jesus, they will be healed. And so these guys get a stretcher. They obviously have this friend who is paralyzed. We don't know if he is quadriplegic. We don't know if he is paraplegic. You know, quad means you can't move any of your limbs, uh, really. You can't use any of your limbs. You might have a little bit of function. Paraplegic from the waist down. We don't know what he was. He was paralyzed. He couldn't get to Jesus on his own. And so these four guys who no doubt love their friend, picked up a stretcher, put their friend on the stretcher, and they're carrying this man. It's, it's heavy. This is dead weight you're carrying around. They're carrying this guy over to Jesus, and they get there, and they're going, hmm, it seems like we have a little bit of a problem here. And they are not going to be denied. And so usually there was some steps going up to the roof on these kind of homes and you go up on the, on the roof and, and there's usually uh, some mud that's been mixed together and kind of packed down to keep the rain and weather out over top some tiles of, uh, of uh, thatch or whatever they used on the roof. And they get up on top there and they know they got to get their friend to Jesus. They bring him up on the stretcher and it's just like if I was preaching right now and somebody just started drilling a hole in the ceiling. And stuff started falling down, and uh, they were not going to be denied to bring their friend to Jesus. And so they take him up on the roof, and they lower him down, and, uh, and they put him in front of Jesus. This morning, let me just ask you a question. Who are you a friend to? I'm not even going to ask the question, who is your friend? I want to ask you even a greater question this morning. Who are you really a friend to? Who can count on you in the most difficult of times? Who, can, who, could know, who, who is it that would know that if they were going through a difficult time, you would put them on a stretcher and you would take them to Jesus, whatever that meant? That's what I love about the question this morning. It doesn't matter what it means, what you need Jesus to do for you. Whatever it is, Jesus can do it. And so this man needed to be healed, but when they brought him to Jesus, they had to bring him. And so this morning I want to ask you the question, who is it that you're a friend to? It's one of the reasons why we have care groups. And in fact, uh, Ron and uh, Pastor Carolyn and the group are going to be meeting at 10 o'clock today to talk about care groups. Because we have a dream in this church that every person would have a friend. Uh, you know what, one of the things that keeps me up uh, awake at night is that people don't have friends. And I've, I've said to our care group leaders, people don't need a friendly church, they need friends. They don't so much need a friendly church, and Carolyn is going to talk to our leaders today about that. And so if you're a care group leader or host, I encourage you to, is it B2? Meet in B2 with them today because they want to talk about this ministry of befriending people. Yeah, I know that you're here, many of you, and you have friends. You don't need any more friends. But what about people who come into our church? They need friends. I've told you the story before about my brother who went to church for two years and he never made a friend. And I know my brother is so shy. He, it's hard for him to make friends, but nobody somehow got him to get included in the church. And we need people to become friends with other people. Boy, it's, time's running out fast here. I want to tell you this story uh, from journalist Bob Green. He tells the following story in a book uh, with a long title. It's entitled, And You Know You Should Be Glad, A True Story of Lifelong Friendship. That's a long title. But he tells this story that just gripped my heart. I... As I read it last night, it just, just brought tears to my eyes because of this friendship. He said, there are a handful of people during your lifetime who know you well enough to understand when the right thing to say is to say nothing at all. Those people, and there will be at most only a few of them, will be with you during your very worst times. 
And he goes on to say, when during an already painful juncture in my life, already going through a difficult situation, he said, my wife died. I was so numb that I felt dead myself. And in the hours after her death, as our children and I tried to, in vain to figure out what to do next, how to get from hour to hour, the phone must have been ringing, but he said, I have no recollection of it. Bob said, the next morning, one of those mornings when you awaken, blink for the start of the day, and then a dispiriting second later, realize anew what has just happened and feel the boulder press you against the earth with such weight that you feel that you will never be able to get up. He said, during that time, the phone rang, and it was Jack. Bob said, I didn't want to hear any voice. I just wanted to cover myself with darkness. I knew he would be asking if there was anything he could do, but I should have known that he'd already done it. Jack said, I'm in Chicago. I misunderstood him. I thought he was offering to come to Chicago. But no, he said, I took the first flight this morning. He said, I heard and I flew out. I know you probably don't want to see anyone, and that's all right. I've checked into a hotel, and I'll just sit in the room in case you need me for anything. I can do whatever you want, or I can do nothing. And he meant it, Bob said. He knew the best thing he could do was to be present in the same town, to tell me he was there, and he did. He, and he did. He just sat there, Bob said. I assume he watched TV or did some work, but he waited until I gathered the strength to say that I needed him. He helped me with things no man ever wants to have help with. Mostly, he sat with me, and I knew I did not he and knew that I did not require conversation and did not welcome chatter, did not need anything beyond the knowledge that he was there. He brought food for my children, and by sharing my silence he got me through those days this is the only point we're going to get to today but friends in the church today I think the message for us is is that there are people all around us who need somebody to put them on a stretcher and they need them they need to be brought to Jesus to say this is what I need for Jesus but you know what my experience is my experience is is that many times those people lay there with nobody to bring them to Jesus. So this morning, you might be one of those people who are here, and you're here because you need an encounter with Jesus, and you need friends. I want to pray for you this morning. I want to pray that Cooks Hill Community Church will be a place where you can be friends to somebody else, and you can have friends.